Welcome to the Battle Blitz webinar series. The title of this session is called Crypto Quant, Trading Virtual Currencies Using Quantitative Strategies. Crypto is once again back in the limelight as institutional acceptance is growing. As capital continues to flow into the virtual currency world, managers are revving up multiple trading strategies. Quants are posting impressive returns as limited historical data is beginning to reveal the anomalies of the currencies. Why are quantitative-based strategies effective in crypto trading? Can quantitative crypto strategies outperform a simple buy and hold strategy? What other cryptocurrencies lend themselves well to trading? And we will answer these questions and many more in this exciting and timely one-hour webinar. My name is Bart Kellerman, and I will be your host. You are participating in a live interactive webinar with over 300, actually 350, registered fellow participants representing a broad set of international quantitative industry professionals, including quantitative managers, data providers, data buyers, and a variety of institutional investors. Your questions may be submitted in the Q&A box on your screen at any time, and a live Q&A session will take place at the end. First of all, I would like to thank our sponsors. Strix Leviathan is an investment manager that provides actively managed exposure to the cryptocurrency markets. The firm utilizes a systematic approach and proprietary technology to mitigate risk and doubt drawdowns. Through Strix Leviathan, investors can gain secure and diverse exposure to cryptocurrencies. Proxima Capital is a quant automated trading firm with a focus on market neutral strategies in the crypto space. Proxima holds the thesis that the crypto markets will continue to trade more than just native crypto assets and eventually emerge and replace the traditional markets. Proxima is positioning itself to benefit from and to catalyze the transition to the future. Thank you, Proxima. Okay, let's get started. First, we're gonna hear from our keynote, Nico Cordero, who will give an overview on what is happening in the crypto world followed by our crypto quant focused panel of industry experts. And we will finish with a Q&A session and an exciting lightning round. Nico is the Chief Investment Officer at Strix Leviathan. We are proud to have Nico on board as he served as a platoon sergeant in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nico, there is a lot of attention in the crypto world, not just on Bitcoin, but now on Ethereum and other coins. Before we get to how your quant strategy is generating alpha, please lay the groundwork for us of the current crypto landscape and how you see it evolving and providing trading opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the introduction, Bart. Um, yeah, and you're, you're, you're absolutely right. We've seen an expansion of institutional capital moving uh, well beyond Bitcoin. I mean, it, today and historically, much of the discussion around crypto has centered around thesis or thematic driven investing, you know, how cryptocurrencies will play into a new global economic system. As such, you know, the first foray into crypto, what we're seeing is taking long beta exposure to the asset class through venture style allocations and more recently longer term macro plays. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing play out today. Um, while there's certainly nothing wrong with uh, that approach um, and has at least up until today been a great addition to a traditional portfolio, given the asset classes untethered connection to other assets and the real economy. Um, at some point, the eye-popping gains that draw media and investor attention alike will turn into stomach-churning losses for those who go the long beta route and are new to this asset class. Um, instead, I would propose that the real appeal of cryptocurrencies as an asset class is the myriad of trading opportunity, opportunities that do not exist anywhere else. Crypto is an inefficient and descent frontier where hedge funds can deliver on the original promise of truly uncorrelated alpha as a mechanism for allocators to move portfolios further up the efficient frontier. And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the, the inflows over the next few years is less uh, institutions turn maximalist for Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any specific application of cryptocurrencies and more around, you know, how you can provide this truly uncorrelated return stream. And there are several features of the cryptocurrency asset class that make it particularly appealing for trading. Uh, first is the persistence in returns, and I quantify that here with the Hearst exponent as measured against a few uh, more traditional asset classes. 
the Hearst is a method to measure the decay and autocorrelation and is a statistical measure of how much memory a time series holds. In more layman terms, cryptocurrencies are more predictable and less random than other asset classes. The second feature is the volatility that has been more or less a consistent feature of this asset class, despite the exponential growth in volumes, institutionalization, and adoption. While volatility is generally considered a net negative, the volatility in the space is what contributes to the persistence of exploitable trading patterns within this space. So the question then becomes, you know, for allocators considering stepping into the space for the first time is will these features continue to persist? And I believe they will. Part of that is driven by behavioral phenomena as there are thousands of cryptocurrency assets competing for attention and capital, which are all at different stages of technological development. There's varied use cases and applications. Not all are buying to be currencies in the way that Bitcoin and some others are. Some are decentralized hosting platforms more similar to AWS than they are to gold. Others are decentralized user applications uh, such as lending protocols um, that have no third party intermediary between the lender and borrower. You know, given the state of where we're at today in the technological development, the fundamental value of any of these assets is opaque and in some cases non-existent, which leads to a reflexive property where hype and mimetic flows dominate. You know, the question, why is Dogecoin up 10,000% year to date? Well, because no one actually knows what the driving force is. And some, you know, one can only watch their buddies get filthy rich so many times before the allure becomes too strong and they join in. You know, and I've seen this go for institutional investors as much as it does for individuals. And the other reason we believe the volatility and persistence will persist is because, um, or at least in the short to medium term, is the market structure. There are thousands of assets. They trade 24-7, 365 days a year. All are priced in various base currencies, some from uh, native Bitcoin and Ethereum to the U.S. dollar to the Indonesian rupiah. Um, and it's difficult, if not impossible, for any individual investor to keep up with the various news cycles and global drivers that impact price, which add to the already substantial uncertainty around future outcomes. You know, so, and in addition to trading across all of these various base currencies, you know, they trade across a wide variety of different liquidity venues. So order books are scattered um, across the globe. This frequently results in mismatched liquidity needs for market participants and creating, you know, which creates persistent arbitrage opportunities and trading opportunities. Additionally, many of the liquidity venues provide leverage um, through various mar uh, margin products like perpetual futures. Um, a lot of folks who come from the traditional space are really surprised that investors, both retail and institutional, can gain access to 100x leverage with relative ease. You know, and that's in uh, an asset class that has volatility not seen elsewhere. Um, you know, this leverage, again, creates uh, trading opportunities, which I'll demonstrate here shortly. Um, in, in creating liquidity cascades, essentially across all of these fragmented order books. As a demonstration of just how fragmented the liquidity, uh, here I've displayed a snapshot of the volume over the last 12 months for both spot volumes and uh, perpetual future volumes. Uh, perpetual futures, for those of you that are not familiar with them, they're often referred to as perps by those who are trading within this asset class. They are a type of futures product that has no expiration, so they act more or less as a synthetic spot mechanism um, with the added benefit of leverage for those seeking a truly intense uh, volatility. Uh, over the last year, we saw $70 billion of daily volume spread across 400 exchanges. Um, here we have a sample of those exchanges. And you know it, it just further adds to the complexity of the market structure since all of these exchanges uh, are scattered across the globe, sit under different regulatory regimes, have different technical implications, margin requirements, have varying levels of order book depth. Um, and, and all of this changes over time. If I had given you a similar snapshot 12 months ago of the trailing 12 months, many of these uh, exchanges would, or at least the proportion of where volume sits within this asset class would look very different. In addition to the fragmentation and complexity we see in the spot market, we're also seeing a growth in one, the uh, institutional options markets, which adds new venues and additional complexity, but more so is the rise of decentralized exchanges, which have grown in just the last 12 months to roughly $2 billion a day of volume. This adds additional pricing uh, pressures and uh, complexity for an individual trader or market participant to pay attention to. Um, for those that are not aware, these decentralized exchanges are 
smart contract protocols that are built on top of base layer cryptocurrencies like Ethereum or Solana. All of this complexity and fragmentation feeds into and perpetuates the behavior we experience in the asset class. Um, and this is what creates tremendous trading opportunities for firms, both from a market neutral price anomaly perspective, as well as you know, figuring out ways to deliver better risk adjusted directional exposure. To demonstrate that here, I have a, a, a short or a few equity curves over the last three years. These are very naive strategies. I wouldn't recommend anybody goes out and do these, but we start with the uh, a market cap weighted index in the orange. You can see very nasty drawdown or, uh, during 2018. We hit a rough, uh, roughly about 80% drawdown for those that were long beta. Um, then we have a momentum. It's a very simple momentum strategy. Go long in an uptrend, go short in a downtrend. Um, almost delivers an identical return to uh, buying and holding without, or at least a reduced downside and uh, uh, risk exposure. And then here we have what I call an idiosyncratic bet. And uh, there are an endless number of these within this asset class. So I mentioned previously perpetual futures. Uh, for those who uh, are not familiar with the contracts, the way that uh, exchanges and liquidity venues keep prices aligned with spot prices is through a mechanism called funding rate. Um, so essentially those that are long will have to pay the shorts. Um, and this adjusts over time, depending on the, you know, how far uh, the futures price uh, moves from spot. So this incentivizes market makers to come in and, and short the futures to bring price more in line with spot. And here is, a, a, you can see here, it's a very simple strategy um, where we just go long when the futures uh, or the funding rate is very low. This implies low leverage within the system. And then we go short when leverage is extremely high. Uh, you get a, a very nice return, um, totally independent of market returns. All right. And then we have a futures basis return over time. So this is just long uh, Bitcoin spot, short CME future. Again, a very high sharp strategy that has continued to persist. Um, you know, two or three years ago, I would not have guessed that three years later, we would still have the type of uh, basis trades that are available within this asset class. And then the final two equity curves are just for comparison, uh, the, the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500. And that concludes, uh, concludes what I have to say on the asset class, uh, Bart, uh, happy to answer any additional questions. Hey, Nico, yeah, before we move on, um, are we in a, you know, I, I see you have a, um, you know, a momentum strategy in there. Do you think that we're in a, um, a negative uh, Bitcoin momentum uh, environment right now with uh, Bitcoin dropping from 63 down to 50? No, I don't know if I'd call it negative. Uh, Bitcoin is definitely stalled. And, you know, I'd, I'd say from a momentum perspective, we need to start seeing some upside moves before people get nervous. But, you know, I think that we should also pay attention to the fact that, you know, Bitcoin went from 4,000 to 60,000 in the last 12 months. Um, and, you know, some period of consolidation is going to be normal. Gotcha. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, that was a uh, that was a great overview. I mean, I think uh, anybody watching your presentation is fascinated by the complexity and the broad based opportunities in the crypto world and the fact that it's, uh, you know, nonstop trading. Uh, you certainly have your work cut out for you, but we'll we'll get back to you on the panel discussion and get into a little bit more detail on your perspectives on the market. Let's Let's move on to our um, officially move on to the panel discussion. That was a great, um, you know, keynote. Uh, I will be the moderator, and we will now hear from our highly respected panelists. Each panelist will initially have two minutes to address this webinar's crypto quant subject matter from their perspective. Perspective after which time we will start the discussion. So um, let's hear first uh, from Oliver Chalk who is the co-founder and director at Proxima Capital. And he's coming to us live from across the globe, all the way from Sydney, Australia. Um, Oliver, as indicated by Nico, this is a highly complex, inefficient in many cases, and relatively new marketplace for trading and becoming more complex on a daily basis. How does Proxima approach the opportunities to quantitatively trade and generate alpha in this, uh, this environment? Thank you, Bart. Well, you're definitely right. Crypto is a breath of fresh air in a world that is stagnated in terms of uh, innovation in the finance industry. And then quite literally every weekend, you'll find a new product launching in the space. 
that at least brings something new to the table. And so uh, staying on top of that is a, is a full-time job in and of itself. And our approach to it is to, you know, play within the inefficiencies to pull out, you know, a market neutral return uh, without actually taking a long or short position on crypto itself as an asset class. Um, I'll go into a bit of background on us. So um, we recently launched our fund back in March 1st. We were previously a prop shop, uh, just trading private capital, uh, focusing on spot arb. But as we explored the space, uh, we, you know, we saw a huge demand for capital that wasn't being met by traditional institutions. And so we now have three market neutral strategies, one of which um, Nico has already touched on, and that's the semi-automated basis trading. Uh, we primarily, primarily target perpetuals, so not the CME. Uh, and that you know yields a higher return but is you know more risky um in terms of our strategy we are us dollar denominated despite being out of australia and we don't actually take any crypto exposure um in terms of spot spread and slippage in the space uh nico was right in that there are 400 exchanges uh in the cent centralized exchange place but also in the dex space there's quite a few more and so you know when you actually come to connecting to the markets so there's over 7,000, um, you know, cryptos in this space. And that's before we get into options and, uh, and derivatives. So we're just talking about actual assets here. Um, and all the sort of derivatives that sit on top of that mean that execution in of itself is a com complex problem. You can't simply open a brokerage account and rely on getting the best price. And I guess that inefficiency is what creates opportunity for a shop like ourselves that is based more on low time frame HFT strategies. But it can also be an area that brings sort of great uncertainty and danger if you're if you're trying to run a quant strategy here what you back test uh, will often not play out in reality once you start to take into account sort of adverse effects of you know falsified data uh, high spreads and even fees that can sometimes be a little bit dishonest when you actually look into them uh, so you know moving on beyond just the spot sort of landmine that is the complexity explosion of cryptos and exchanges you know, once we get into derivatives and leverage, you know, that's where it gets really, you know, dicey. Um, one of the things mentioned prior was the interest rates to go long. Uh, and because there's not, a, not many institutions lending to the space, uh, there's, a, there's a huge demand to go long in crypto from all of the retail pressure uh, that we see sort of interest rates that regularly exceed 100% uh, per annum spot. And so if you have a thesis or some sort of model uh, you know, that, that you believe to have a return, if you actually go long, you could find yourself locked in a position that is costly to exit, actually paying an interest rate that will exceed any sort of edge you may have had through that model. And so really understanding what you're exposed to when you enter a trade is, is critical in terms of uh, taking on leverage in this place, in this space and trying to pick up, you know, an edge. Uh, and then beyond that, there's also a whole host of technical issues once you really get into it, there's, there's not a whole lot of regulation outside of uh, the traditional uh, venues. And once you get into the, some of the more liquid markets that are uh, abroad arbitraging the regulatory environment, they actually trade 24 seven, but when markets move, you could have indexes going offline, your futures contracts could start to move against you. There's a lot to sort of unpack and, and play off when it comes to extreme volatility and dealing with it safely in the space. Um, and you know, that's, that's just all the centralized infrastructure, which is quite immature. Now, once we actually throw DeFi into the mix, you know, we'll find that beyond just having a multitude of assets and venues in the centralized space, you also have a completely new environment to play within. So, you know, Ethereum is sort of what kickstarted this DeFi uh, revolution. Uh, they introduced smart contracts, um, for those more technical, but less familiar with blockchain, it's like everyone decided to write their exchanges and their financial applications in a single computer and shared all of the APIs with each other openly. Um, you know, that sounds crazy, but that's what's out there today. And it means arbitrage is technically risk-free in that you are the single user of that computer at any one time, but then things like, you know, new orders and cancels start to cost you real money as you have to bid for compute on that computer. And so, you know, what used to be a question of who was the fastest, who had the best latency and who could, you know, manage risk for being a passive actor in the book has completely shifted to now one where you need to be really good at winning uh, priority gas auctions or the game theory of a winner pay all auction, uh, which basically means even if you don't get an order into the market, you're still paying. And so trying to model that into your, you know, quantitative algorithms 
uh, is non-trivial and it's not something that many people will have seen before. And so taking that into account, if you are going to be, going to be touching the DeFi angle uh, is, is of utmost importance. And it's sort of something that creates a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of risk as they tend to go hand in hand. Uh, and then in terms of my sort of view on the space, that's, that's about it. Um, it's maybe a little bit more dark, but I do want to stress that with all of this complexity, blow up is really just an endless source of opportunity and, and new learning uh, in the space. That's for sure. No, absolutely, Oliver. I think you painted a really fair picture in terms of the complexities. Uh, we did have a question that came in while you were talking from Teddy Repco. Why is basis trading perpetual futures riskier than on the CME? Uh, the risk comes in that your interest rate is not guaranteed, uh, in that it is depending on your market, either updating hourly or eight hourly, really depending on the contract specification. Um, and also the reliance on indexes means that you can be locked paying basis while not being able to exit your position. Um, so that risk is generally outweighed by the generally higher interest rates, but it is something to keep in mind. It's not as simple as two trades and go on holidays. It's, it's an actively managed strategy, uh, but still market neutral is what I'd say to that. Yeah, I gotcha. All right. Thanks for that. Um, well, uh, really appreciate it. Let's move on uh, to our next panelist. And uh, that would be Yuval Reisman. Uh, Yuval Reisman is the co-founder and CEO at YRD Capital, and he's coming to us from London. Um, Yuval, it's great to have you uh, to participate again. You, uh, last time I saw you, you joined us uh, for our physical event uh, on the crypto panel at the Battle of the Quants in London in 2019. Seems like a long time ago. Uh, you decided to create a very specific fund of funds, which focuses exclusively on quantitative crypto trading. What did you see in the overall market that led you to select that niche? So first, a pleasure being here. And thank you very much, Bart, for inviting me. Indeed, the world changed significantly since we met last time in London. And I think none of us have had imagined that in a year or so, Bitcoin will reach $65,000. Morgan Stanley would pitch crypto funds to their investors and Nomura will set up a prime broker for, for the asset class. So I think I'm happy to be on the panel and I'm happy to be in the, on the asset class. Regarding your question, I'll explain how I, uh, how I entered the asset class and it would, um, it would relate to it. So back in early 2017, I began speculating on ICOs. I wouldn't call it investing, I would call it speculation. And in um, three months, we did 5x our money. We thought we were smart, but actually we were just lucky to convert dollars to Ethereum and Bitcoin, but this was a bull run. And then we found out there are arbitrage, very simple arbitrage back then. You can sit in front of your computer and R between exchanges. And then I understood I'm not made to be a, a, a daily trader and I would lose my mind if I would do so. So I, would, I looked for a fund that does full-time professionally arbitrage and started to invest my money. And in, in a high risk, high return environment, it better be diversified. So this is how we came up with the idea of, um, of a fund of fund that's specifically focused on, on crypto assets. And going back and comparing between 2017 to now, how the marketplace had, had changed. So talent-wise, back then I was the oldest guy in the room and, I, and I'm 40. And today you have top tier talent, guys from former Two Sigma Renaissance, Goldman, etc., taking their strategies from fiat to crypto. Uh, I'm invested in a few traders that are in their 50s and 60s, guys with 20, 30 years of, of experience in, in trading. Exchange-wise, back then there was only spot. Now we have futures and options, and as, as, as the guys mentioned before. And the ecosystem. Back then it was the wild, wild west. Now it's just the wild west, but we have custody by Fidelity and World Garden, etc. And zooming into my to the two slides I'm, I'm sharing. So two slides, I want to keep it simple. I want to stress one, high volatility. And high volatility means high returns for some strategies, like the strategies that the guys explained about before, and higher caliber than people under, understand, which means or could mean lower risk. With regards to this slide, I think the important thing here is to see and be convinced that Bitcoin is far more volatile than other asset classes, and this comes from Bridgewater. And when, when Ray Dalio decides to write his thoughts on Bitcoin, this is not 2017 anymore. And 
And I would just say, because I don't want to repeat what the guys mentioned in, in their presentations, that this is like the options market back in the days and then hedge funds and then the first ones who did short, etc. So timely opportunity. And, and, and as you heard of the basis trading, there are opportunities with, with lower risk than what people understand. Um, and I don't know if you follow the market, but over the last 24 hours, Bitcoin fell 11%. And Nico mentioned that last year average daily volume was 70 billion. In the last 24 hours, Bitcoin itself had a volume of $100 billion. Dogecoin, which I think is a joke, fell by 17% with an $11 billion um, daily volume. So with such volumes and, and, and liquidity by the second, uh, top traders can make impressive returns. So uh, the ecosystem, I, everyone in the call probably heard of Coinbase. Coinbase went public for 77 billion valuation. You know, if you're an exchange and you go for a 77 billion valuation, I guess you do spend some money to protect against cyber attacks and to, to prevent hacks, etc. I don't know how many of you heard of Binance, but Binance has volume 10 times of Coinbase, even if their valuation is not 10 times higher, but just five. It means that they're not very far from JP Morgan with 310 billion valuation or Morgan Stanley with 155. And today, Fidelity is custody, is doing custody for crypto assets. I mentioned before that Nomura set up a daughter company to be a prime broker in the asset class. So I wish to convey the message that it's less risky than people think because the, the ecosystem is way more advanced and with very high caliber service providers, traders, et cetera, et cetera. Still a high risk investment. Again, this is why still I invest my money in a diversified way, but a high return in a relatively low risk and people understand. And it's nice to profit from volatility because even in days like today when Bitcoin falls 11%, we can smile. And that's it for me. I, I got you. All right, great. Well, um, yeah, thanks for that, Yuval. Uh, it's a good perspective. We're going to come back to you and talk a little bit more about um, what you're seeing, maybe go into more about what drives the price of crypto versus an Apple on the conventional markets. But we'd like to move um, on, to, uh, on, on to Christina Dolan. Uh, Chris is the founder and CEO of Inside Chains. Interesting fact about Chris is that she actually competed in the World Cup as a skeleton slider. Uh, Chris is also a graduate of the famed Media Lab at MIT. Chris, you've done a lot of work looking at the digital currency space and what the future holds, and therefore what trading vehicles exist for quants. Please take us through why virtual currencies will persist, why the decentralized concept momentum will continue, and your perspective on these, uh, what's kind of gotten a little bit of attention lately, these CBDCs, which are the central bank cryptocurrencies. As you know, the top 10 countries of the world have digital cryptocurrency plans in China's way ahead of most of them and their potential dominance in the future. Um, and on that last point, are we at risk of having central bank currencies dominate the marketplace and make all other coins superfluous? superfluous, thereby limiting the currencies able to be traded. So uh, thank you for that intro. And um, and before I, I move on to the central bank uh, digital currency uh, aspects of this, uh, what I'd like to do is sort of start off a little bit with the sort of programmable aspects of uh, digital assets, because I think I mean, obviously, Nico and Oliver and um, you've all sort of uh, gave you a sense of sort of what's going on in the market with respect to crypto. But when you think about what's created this incredible momentum, um, you think about how, uh, you know, the, the sort of economic philosophy of, you know, of how Bitcoin got launched, um, you know, you sort of had the perfect storm last year with respect to, you know, all this money being, um, you know, all this liquidity because all these central banks uh, printing uh, nonstop money. And so, you know, people were feeling that their currency was being devalued. Uh, the yield from traditional fiat currencies was decreasing. 
Um, and so when, you know, while governments talk about inflation from, you know, with respect to, you know, these, these indexes that don't include things like homes, education, medical expenses, the reality is that um, if you put your money in a traditional bank with fiat currency, you're losing 2% a month. So as a result of that, there is this momentum, just like there's been this momentum to move to these, um, you know, these, these new types of banks, uh, you know, even like the Robin Hoods of the world. So th I consider this to be a sort of a movement that's not going away. So that's part of what's driving this momentum and volatility. So in terms of like the next slide, which talks a little bit about what everybody else has been talking about. So you've already got this momentum, right? Um, and now all of a sudden you have all of these applications that's really it's really being used by the community from lending, investing. Um, I mean, obviously the uh, non-fungible tokens. Uh, there's there's a lot of activity that's going on, and the the infrastructure is getting much more mature. Um, you know, while you you do have the volatility that you heard about with respect to um, you know uh, this morning, and you you have comments about the Dogecoin, and you know Yellen talks about you know the, the possibility the the yield curve is going to you know uh, uh, change, and that in the future we're going to have higher interest rates, and all of this creates a an additional sort of uh, volatility, I don't think that crypto is going to go away because the maturity on this platform and the infrastructure that's evolving is not going away anytime soon. So now to go to the last slide, uh, which is talk about the sort of central bank digital currencies. I've talked about the momentum is there. Uh, it's not going anywhere. You've got the infrastructure that's building all these applications and you know that's actually creating sort of a stronghold in this space. And today people use stable coins to be able to you know, hold their money in crypto and sort of uh, move in and out of the market. And so these leading stable coins are now probably have higher volumes than some of the other coins that people are actually investing in. And you actually even have yields on these, on these different uh, stable coins. But in terms of the um, central bank digital currencies, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about how these, this programmable money uh, might have things like fees and taxes built into them. Um, think about what happened in Cyprus that created uh, you know, interest in uh, Bitcoin a number of years ago because the banks were able to, you know, pull in money out of the, you know, the, um, the, the government was able to put money, pull money out of people's banks, bank accounts, right? So the idea that these central bank digital currencies might have that power with this programmability is a little scary. So I actually think it's actually going to increase the interest in Bitcoin, which is less programmable than um, basically take over and wipe out this whole space. So hopefully I answered the question there, Bart. <laughs> Absolutely. Very good, Chris. Uh, there's, um, there's there are a lot of questions here. I think we're going to wait until we get to our uh, panel discussion, which is, um, which is going to start now. So thanks for that um, evolving complexity of the future. And it'll be fun to watch and present a lot of trading to profit to the smartest and most agile traders, that's for sure. Um, so let's begin our panel discussion. And... Um, you know, we've had a lot of different questions, but one of the biggest questions that's looming is what what really is the biggest risk risk to uh, to trading crypto? And um, Nico, why don't you uh, take that first? We haven't heard from you in a little bit. So, what do you think is the biggest risk risk to trading cri cryptos for an investor? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest risk is technology risk. Um, like a lot of this is very very new. Um, we haven't seen these exposed to this type of scale before, you know, as you've all mentioned, things have just exploded in the last 12 months and accelerated what was probably originally a 20 to 30 year timeline. Um, so, so the biggest concern for me is, is, you know, basically protocol failure, you know, at that point, liquidity instantly dries up. And if you're in a position, at least directionally exposed, you're, you're stuck in that position and you're not going anywhere. Gotcha. Um, you've all, do you want to handle that question as well? Yeah, thank you. So uh, one major risk would be exchange hack. Uh, with all respect, even to Coinbase, it's still not Nasdaq. One exchange are centralized uh, coins like USDT. So USDT is controlled by a group of people and some of the things there are not really clear. It may collapse one day. That's a major risk. And another big risk is that many of the managers in this space are emer emerging managers, the first time fund managers. And, you know, if you don't manage things properly, you could get a margin call and, and wipe out the fund 
I know a fund that lost $20 million in one day back in what we call in crypto, the black March, 18th of March in 2020, when Bitcoin price went out and went down by 50% in one day. That's the day that Nico mentioned where Bitcoin touched bottom at $4,000. So these are some of the risks. Yeah. Um, Oliver, I'm sure you have, uh, you know, you, you basically outlined a ton of risks in this marketplace, but there are is there anything that really stands out as as a as a predominant risk uh, in trading crypto? Um, I would say Yuval covered it pretty well. So you've got the classic counterparty risk uh, that extends to stable coins, like you mentioned. So USDT, even USDC, a lot of these, uh, you know, you may trust the company, but they still have a private key that can upgrade the contract and empty a lot of wallets uh, off the back of that. Um, so you're relying on their custody. So you know, sort of the antithesis of crypto is, is counterparties uh, to a degree, uh, but they're still very prevalent in the space. You know, DEX is, while exciting, a very small portion of trading. So from that point of view, I'd say counterparty is our by far biggest risk and the one to manage most closely. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of a fun question uh, that just came through from uh, Gudrun Zoller. Uh, which of the top volume 50 cryptos do you like the best um uh nico i mean usually quants don't really have preferences but uh, is there anything that that you see out there that that you enjoy uh, putting into your portfolio yeah I, I would i would probably jokingly say whichever one goes up the most um but if i was forced to pick one i'd say the most interesting project it would probably be ethereum at the moment um largely because of what it's trying to do and uh, the scale it's achieved. Although it's, it's incredibly uncertain. Um, there's a lot of technical feats they need to accomplish to, uh, to properly reach scale. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that Ethereum is so multidimensional and the foundation of, of so many of these smart contracts that it is expected to increase in value by over five, per, five times that of Bitcoin, but that's just, uh, you know, another fund's viewpoint. Um, Oliver, do you have a favorite, or uh, what, what? What do you? What project do you like? Um, you know, if you ask me, do I have a personal favorite outside of work? Um, obviously, I don't buy anything at work. Uh, but personally, I'm also on the Ethereum train. That said, I, I wouldn't call myself a maximalist. If something better comes around, you know, I would consider it. But you know, Ethereum has proven uh, that it's willing to adapt new technology, and as a technologist, that. You know, it makes me at least hopeful that it will stay ahead of the curve, even as competitors come online. So I agree with Nico on that. You, Paul, are you also an Ethereum um, maximalist? No, I'm a maximalist of whatever have the most volume and most volatility. I don't really care what stands behind it. I usually, unless it's, it's, it, it, it relates to a risk. So I'm glad to see Bitcoin trading with a 100 billion daily volume because we're up for profiting from the volatility. And it's, it's a nice and simplistic view. Yeah. Uh, Christina, any view, views on, um, on this? I mean, I would have to agree with everyone else in terms of Ethereum. I mean, there are other programmable uh, protocols, but Ethereum has gotten the most momentum in terms of DeFi and uh, applications. I mean, even the non-fungible tokens that you hear about, you know, all this is being built on Ethereum and there's a very solid community around it that is supporting, communicating, you know, although it's decentralized, it is a very active community. So um, I know I, I've heard, okay, well, thanks for that. Um, there's another interesting question that came out and it's sort of like the elephant in the room when you talk about cryptocurrencies, obviously. And, um, and since we're on the subject of different cryptocurrencies, we have to address it. Is Dogecoin a joke by one of the speakers, or does it really have long-term viability in crypto? Uh, Nico, what's what's your view on that? You mentioned uh, Dogecoin earlier. Yeah, um, well, I jokingly said that my favorite cryptocurrency is the one that goes up the most, and year-to-date, that's Doge. Um, so, so I like it from that perspective. Um, if it's a joke, I mean, it was, it was most certainly founded as a joke. Um, if I remember correctly, it was founded as a way to tip people for good memes on the internet. So not exactly a, a founding that doesn't, uh, isn't a joke. Um, you know, it, it, crypto is interesting in the way that price has a way of building fundamentals. You know, like if something goes up 10,000%, 10 
and it stays up 10,000%, like an ecosystem builds around it. So do I think it's a joke today? Probably. Do I think it could be something more than a joke tomorrow? Yes, would be my answer. Okay, all right. Um, Bart, can I take Oliver. this one as well? Oh, sorry. Only Ball, go ahead. You all go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's a joke and I think it's a bad joke. Um, I was recently quoted in a Bloomberg article that was done on, 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 on this because I think this is like GameStop. Uh, someone is pumping it. This someone is known to all of us as Elon Musk. In, in my view, he might be pumping it because we know that if he would pump Bitcoin, the SEC would chase him. And if you pump Dogecoin, you know, it's a joke. Nobody would chase you. But And obviously, when he pumps Dogecoin, it affects Bitcoin. And I think it's a bad joke because in the end, the retail investors would lose. In the Bloomberg article, you may see that even the creator of Dogecoin thinks it's a joke and is no, no longer involved in the product. So these things, while I agree with Nico and I like tokens that go crazy up and down with a lot of volatility and volume, I think it would cause a, a lot of damage. And these are the things that takes the asset class backward. Oliver, what's your view on uh, Dogecoin? Um, I'll appease everyone, well, both Nico and Yuval, and say I agree with both of their viewpoints. Um, in terms of what it's doing now, I think it's a little bit, or it's quite unhealthy. I don't think what Elon is doing is is adding or it's detracting from the space. In terms of whether it's a joke, I think it's hard to call Dogecoin itself a joke. Uh, the, the source code of Dogecoin is indirectly forked from Bitcoin. So if you can make the claim that Dogecoin as it runs as a protocol is a joke, I wouldn't be holding Bitcoin off the back of that. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to call Bitcoin a joke. So, you know, I'm going to answer by saying yes and no. I think the whole scenario now is a bit unhealthy, though. Yeah, I got you. Okay, I, I've got, let's get back to quants. Um, why are, and this is for the entire panel, of course, uh, why are quant strategies better than um, trading uh, conventional strategies in this space? And uh, can quant you know, quant crypto strategies outperform a simple buy and hold strategy. Obviously, a lot of people just buy Bitcoin and sit on it, and they've been pretty successful with that. So sell sell the listener on why they want to use you guys, quant, to, uh, to help generate a better return if just holding on to it can generate relatively good returns. So... Um, Nico, why don't you why don't you start us off with uh, why why quants versus just buy and hold or some other long short long short strategy? Yeah, so quant versus buy and hold. I mean, it really depends on the re the return profile you're looking for, but we'll keep it directional, systematic quant here for the purposes of the question. Um, you know, this is a lot of people think the the, alt, the speculative mayhem cycle started in 2017, but really this is the, the fourth one that we've seen in this industry. And that's just the nature of being able to speculate and trade on varying ascent technology. So it would be like all of the VC investments from Silicon Valley being listed on an exchange and letting people bet on you know future outcomes that are highly uncertain. Like it lends itself to these boom and bust cycles. Um, so there will be more 80% drawdowns, even though right now it feels like everything will just go up and to the right forever. Um, and direct, you know, systematic directional exposure allows you to um, flip the, the, the left tail of that return profile um, and really target better risk adjusted returns with a similar return profile over the entire life cycle of a, of a, of a speculative cycle. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what are the risk reward and target expectations? Uh, uh, Oliver. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to use uh, your market neutral quantitative based strategy versus others? Look, I, I think they fill sort of different niches and it depends on the investor, what they need in their portfolio, I guess. But yeah, I think quants, are, you know, when you take everything into consideration, provide the sort of safer risk reward adjusted uh, return, unless you have some insight on the fundamental asset class that you want to take a bet on, um, you know, you're generally better off, in my opinion, trying to find, uh, you know, something that is decorrelated and market neutral in terms of strategy. Um, that's at least where I see it. Okay. All right. You've all. I would say like Nico, it depends on what you want to achieve. And, you know, if you would tell me I put a, a dollar on something and I would either lose 80% or make three, four, five X, it, it's interesting. Um, but if I know I'll put a dollar elsewhere and I can generate yearly return of 20 to 50% with very low drawdown, 
I would probably put more money into the second strategy. And, um, you know, we're in a bull run. We need to remember that. But if someone had bought Bitcoin yesterday for $56,000 per Bitcoin, I don't know how they felt a few hours ago when it reached 47000 So it, it depends on the risk appetite. But it's too yeah, yeah. Uh Chris, do you have a view on this? Well, not being a quant trader myself, I probably don't have uh, the same insights on that. So uh, I, I'll hold off on that comment. <laughs> okay. Okay. No worries. Um, you know, one of the big challenges in this industry is obviously uh, historical data and quants are known for leveraging historical data in order to make predictions about the future. Um, could everybody please address how they are are using historical data? Is it adequate? Is, is it is, is are there serious deficiencies? Obviously, there have to be. And if you're not using historical data, um, what are you using in order to make predictions on uh, on taking positions in the different crypto? Uh, we'll start with you again, Nico. Could you give us some perspective on that? Yeah, so uh, data can be a problem within this space. In terms of how much data you have, it really depends on the frequency with which you're trading. So if you're trading, you know, intraday, minute by minute, you know, there's plenty of data at this point. Um, so, so that's one thing. Uh, the, the next is really gathering the data from all those disparate sources that I spoke about uh, earlier on in the presentation. Is is like there's global pricing pressures. They're scattered across, you know, hundreds of exchanges. At least most of the volume is you're, you're still going to be, you know, you still need to have connectivity to 20, 30 plus uh, liquidity venues. You need to normalize and digest uh, all of that data. Um, so, so it can be difficult in this space. As far as what we use on strategies, it really depends on the type of strategy, which is, you know, a more nuanced answer than, you know, I'm sure the listeners want to listen to. But, you know, if you're looking at something like trend, momentum, or other, you know, factor based or factor style uh, trading, then, you know, you have, additional data beyond crypto, right? These, these, these types of behaviors have persisted across asset classes, asset classes for decades, if not centuries. Um, so, so you have some additional data there. And then if it's idiosyncratic bets, for instance, like around the, you know, betting leverage, that's just understanding the market that you operate in and, and you know, teasing out uh, different features that represent those, uh, those behaviors. Right, Oliver, do you wanna take this one on uh, about data? Sure. I guess data is a smaller part of our business. We are, you know, I guess you would liken us to a HFT shop, although this space isn't really in that low frequency yet. Um, but yeah, in the terms of data, I guess making the, or accepting the fact that you will be working with incomplete data and then using that either to your advantage or at least not getting burnt by that is sort of critical. Um, you know, incomplete data, while not a quants uh, ideal scenario or best dream can actually sort of, if you think, you know, I guess a bit outside the box or you work around it can lead to an edge, right? If everyone's sort of working under the same constraints, so the one that can work the best under those constraints, you know, will gain an edge. Um, not the, the market's that small that everyone's in direct composition, but, you know, that's the sort of view I hold is that, you know, while we are a mat you know, immature space, um, you're just going to have to understand that uh, incomplete data is something that can become uh, sort of a competitive advantage almost. Yeah, yeah, interesting viewpoint. Okay, that pretty much concludes our uh, panel discussion. We're going to go right into uh, our Q&A, um, getting quite a few questions uh, on this event. And um, everybody, for those of you who don't have your questions answered, each question and the individual's information will be sent to each one of the panelists to follow up and answer some of the questions that we might not get to. So um, don't worry. Um, I had a, there's a very specific question I had for Chris. Um, will the evolution of central bank digital currencies uh, increase or decrease the demand for crypto? What's what's your perception on that? Well, you know, obviously you've heard throughout the panel that there is uh, a growing uh, momentum of applications that are being built on top of these protocols and technologies. You also have, um, you know, a lot of people and with respect to the Dogecoin that we talked before, um, while it might be thought of as being a joke, uh, what's interesting about 
the um, these these technologies is that you think about these non younger generation of kids who've come from video games and you know treasure you know all kinds of coins. So um, there's a momentum that's going on there that's making crypto uh, you know in institutionalizing crypto. The CBDCs, I think, are also going to attempt to be digital. I don't know if they'll be crypto, but they will be digital. And I think that uh, at this point, the fact that they will have these uh, programmable rules on the back end makes them a little bit scary. So I don't know if that adoption is going to be as um, fluid. And I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that the central bank digital currencies are going to have other effects like um, you know, the, the use of them between different countries and maybe less of a dominance and use of the dollar. Uh, so they'll have these other more macroeconomic effects. So it'll be interesting. Uh, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's going to in any way impact. If anything, it'll probably make people run to crypto faster. <laughs> gotcha. All right. So that's good to know that uh, they're not going to absolutely take over the world. Um, and then shut out all the, these uh, unique cryptocurrencies for trading. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Nico, do you take the same approach modeling strategies for each cryptocurrency, or do they differ from one another? I would assume that you probably have a different type of viewpoint for each cryptocurrency, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, I feel like this is the answer to every question you ask, but it's a little nuanced. Some strategies we build for the entire market class, and one of the thresholds we look at is like, does it work across everything? Um, and then there are more specific, um, more uh, idiosyncratic bets that is uh, specific to each asset. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right, that's interesting. You know, I've got, we just had an interesting question come in here. Um, Oliver, you mentioned uh, HFT. What are the experiences uh, with regards to higher frequency space in the crypto market and what challenge um, do you think needs to be addressed? I, I think you touched on that earlier. Okay, sure. Um, in terms of you know HFT, obviously in the top markets, it's, it's already there and in the top assets as well. Um, you know, the race to zero isn't fully underway. Um, you know, not everyone is just pouring, you know, millions and billions into the fastest lines, and, you know, setting up towers and stuff, but it will, you know, happen over time. I guess the thing that is holding it back is the fact that there are so many assets. You know, if you have the fastest connection, but you're only trading Bitcoin and ETH, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So it forces a lot of firms uh, to understand the space and to also you know, get smart about how they trade and tap into DeFi. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, a firm that wants to, you know, get the arbitrage, which is a sort of winner takes all event, I uh, will need to have really good coverage of assets and, and markets and, and the nuances of the space. So that is sort of slowing down the race to zero compared to what some may have thought, you know, has gone on in the space and, and definitely on the top exchanges, you know, if you're not the fastest, you will get picked off. But apart from that, you know, there's quite a still uh, immature and slow space here. Mm, okay. Uh, this is a very, this is a little bit of a complex question. And Nico, I'd like you to, to sort of take this one on. Uh, it's from Robert Shoemaker. Uh, many academic papers on crypto as an asset class have shown advantages in adding crypto as a good diversifier. I know there's a lot of wealth advisors who've, uh, you know, who are saying, you know, put at least 1% of your money into a cryptocurrency, just participate. Uh, the conclusions are time dependent, however, and benefits may not hold in the future. Two things. Number one, bubble could burst permanently, or number two, returns start to align with other asset classes. Um, do these possibilities lessen the argument for cryptos? Um, Yes, as the way the question is structured. I mean, I agree that they're highly time dependent. And if you add anything to a portfolio that went up, you know, 12 million percent in 10 years, it's going to add benefits, um, at least from a, a quantitative overview. Um, I agree that the bubble could burst permanently. I think that's highly unlikely at this point. There's a lot of capital, um, you know, invested in this space. And, you know, the exponential growth of it, whether you whether we can see it or not, implies there is at least some fundamental value. Um, or application here. Um, but I don't think it less, I think it lessens the argument for beta essentially, which is why, you know, personally I'm an advocate of 
you know, active management. Um, you know, if everything goes to zero, clearly if you're just long and strong, you're going to zero with the asset class. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, great. Well, thanks for that. Okay, uh, I think it's time. We're at uh, we're coming towards the end of this webinar. But what I'd like to do is, um, and I don't think any Bitcoin or crypto event would be complete without asking this question, which we haven't really um, delved into. And the lightning round starts now. Um, what will be, and each one of you, the panelists are going to answer this question. I'm giving them a time limit of five seconds in case they do want to add a little, um, you know, qualifier. But what will be the Bitcoin price? on December 31st, 2021. So at the end of the year, uh, let's start with, um, let's start with uh, Christina. 100K. 100K, okay, so that's uh, exactly double. Uh, Yuval? Just a guess, 70K, but during the year it would pass 100K. Ah, so we, we got a little volatility qualifier in there. Okay, but ending at 70. We're still higher than we are today. Uh, Oliver? Uh, so I'll do one better and go 110K, but that's because it will be 5.5 ETH, which is the flippening, and 20K per ETH. So 110K, the final answer. <laughs> okay, thanks, Oliver. Um, uh, Nico Cordero. Yeah, I actually like Oliver's answer, answer as well. I'll, I'd guess somewhere in the 70 to 80,000% range. 70 to 80. Okay, so that puts us uh, at an average of around 90. Uh, so definitely a much higher price than it is right now. Um, okay, that just about uh, wraps things up. Uh, I'd like to um, thank, uh, thank you once again uh, to our sponsors, Strix Leviathan and Proxima Capital. And thank you to you all. Uh, a recording will be made available in the next couple of days. We look forward to uh, connecting back with you at our next Battle Blitz webinar. Stay tuned. All the best and goodbye.